wings to fly won't take you to the stars. Use the metal for a boat and you won't sail too far. Stop sitting in the dark, stirring metal pots about. You will change your life forever when you figure out. The secret pin code, pin code, pin code, pin code, pin code, Signs can be tricky, it can overheat your brain. Signs can be hard to chew, each bite can be a pain. Stop sitting in the dark, stirring metal pots about. You will change your life forever when you figure out. The secret pin code. Time flows differently for him. He could observe one process on Saturn for weeks on end. Bibi gets so lost in his work, my Bibi. <sighs> what if something bad has happened to him? Well, he'd write if something had, wouldn't he? Of course he would. There's no need to check in if everything's fine. I guess you're right. Hmm? There, Daddy. <gasps> it's from Bibi. So far, things are fine for me here. <laughs> Told you so. Hugs and kisses from Bibi. Okay, what else? Let me see. <sighs> That's it. Well, uh, at least you know that he's all right. Uh, that's good. That's great. <sighs> I can't take this anymore. I have to see my little man! <sighs> we could fly to BB on a rocket, huh? <laughs> rocket travel takes too long. And it's dangerous. I need a device that would let me see my BB all the way from here. Um, a telescope? Nine. Telescope won't do it. BB is way too far. I need to make a device which will allow me to transfer images over a tremendous distance. Then I can see my sweet BB <laughs> waving at me. Isn't he in outer space? How could he send you a picture? I don't want just a picture. What I'm talking about are high quality moving images. Movies, you know. Huh? To me, that sounds kind of like magic. Hmm. <gasps> Not magic. <laughs> hmm? Here. 
Vladimir Kozmich Svorikin was the first to successfully construct a device which was able to send and receive video images. This happened in the year 1931. At that point in time, the inventor was 42 years old. Today, descendants of that device can be found in almost every home, and the word television is known to even the smallest children. I still don't get it. How on earth can an image be transferred to some other place? Very simple. First, you have to split it up into smaller pieces, then pack them all up and send them out. Sounds like magic. When we watch a movie, we are actually seeing many separate still pictures one after another. The image on the screen is made of these frames. The quick changing of frames creates one long moving picture. That is why a video has to be broken into many separate frames before it can be sent somewhere. Moreover, each picture frame has to be broken into smaller parts as well. An image is made of millions of individual dots. These dots are so tiny that we can't even see them. If we transfer information about each dot to another place and recombine the dots in the new place, we can end up with a moving image. I did not understand a bit of that, but I think that's fine. But how can we reassemble all of the dots back into the image? We need something that is able to draw all of the dots incredibly quickly. Eureka! An image can be drawn by a beam of light. Then it will move right along the screen. If the light beam moves fast enough, then we will get frames. A TV screen is made up of separate dots that can translate any image which is sent to it. These dots are called pixels. Based on the information received, the TV lights up the appropriate pixels and we see the picture. Why am I black and white? I'm blue, right? Well, the model hairs Vorikin constructed only worked in black and white. There are too many other colors. It would need too many different colored light beams. It's just really hard. I remember reading there are a few what they call primary colors. Uh, three. And every other color is actually made from them. Oh, that's right. How could I forget? Yes! Indeed, there are three primary colors. They are red and blue and green. We only need three colors to create every color that we know. These primary colors are red, green, and blue. If we project the right kind of light beams on a white background, the white can become any other color. When red and green lights overlap, we see yellow. When green and blue lights overlap, we see aquamarine. And when red and blue overlap, we see magenta. When all three colored lights overlap, we see white. <sighs> I will soon be able to see my little one in color. I was right, I'm blue, look. Good. Now we just have to get the camera up to baby. <laughs> I'm hungry. When BB sends the radio signal with the video image, 
it will be received by this antenna, then pass on to the television. And the TV will convert the signal into a pretty picture. If we make an electron move from one side to the other, it produces waves, like a float on the surface of a pond. These are called electromagnetic waves. Light consists of electromagnetic waves as well. These waves can spread everywhere, even in the space between planets and stars. By monitoring electromagnetic waves, we can see and hear what is happening very far away from us. When electrons move in a transmitting antenna, they produce waves, which scatter in all directions. Receiving antenna capture those waves, which then make electrons inside the receiving device move as well. Thus, we can send and receive sound or images over great distance. Wow, it's snowing really hard in space. That's just the white noise. The signal hasn't arrived yet. Hooray! It's working! Just look, hooray! <laughs> it's better uh, than magic yes. because it's real! Baby, <laughs> it's my baby! There he is! <laughs> Danke, Herr Zvoriken! Thank you, brave pioneer! <laughs> <laughs> hey there, Pin. We came to visit our new best friend, your television. Well, guten tag. I've been giving the television system a teensy gigantic upgrade. Meet your even newer best friend. Huh? <laughs> but that's baby. And then the future of television. <laughs> what a wonderful ship. surprise! Tacos Just for me, a customized day. song! Let's I love it! It's not only clever, way. it's thrifty as well! Come on, I know the song's awesome, but you can't possibly think that's the only thing we got you for your birthday. <laughs> you recall how your encyclopedia is missing a few pages? On D, right near the end, when I couldn't find dubstep? <laughs> Oh, yeah. So weird they're gone. Don't know where they could have gone to. Daco, encyclopedias are a wonderful resource. And that's why they should have every last page. Therefore, we got you a new encyclopedia. Here! I hope the story's interesting. I've never read it. Happy birthday! Happy birthday! Now that he has the one with all the pages, I can learn what dubstep is, I think. Well, let's find it. But, but not so fast. Um, maybe we could start from the beginning, or with ease, or... We have Damon, and Darwin, and <gasps> Daco? Holy 70s haircut, Daco. Why is your picture in here? <gasps> Are you secretly famous? So humble. You never told us. I'm sure it's not me. You know my name is quite common. Come on, Daco. That's you for sure. Let's see what it says. Daco Moose was expelled from the Elk Institute of Scientific Research for his complete failure of a scientific study. His suggestions were so ludicrous that he was immediately kicked off of all research projects, as well as barred from participating in the Cowbell Prize Committee. Oh, dear. Oh, he's also a verb! It means to, um, do something extremely dumb. Mm. Oh. Yes, I'm the dishonored Daco. I'll explain. That's why you couldn't find the original page. It all started years ago at the Academy. It was the year's biggest meeting of important scholars and scientists. I wanted to leave my hoof mark in the history books. I had been working for weeks on what I thought was an exciting hypothesis and I couldn't wait to share it with everyone. Ahem, ladies and gentle elk, 
I'd like to speak today on the subject of reactive gases properties and what we now know. Not so fast, it's not gross. I mean the good gases like oxygen. Oh. Oh. But they aren't all good, of course. Some can be downright dangerous, like some types of chloride can be. Hydrogen sulfide is a different matter. Ammonia, not poisonous, just smelly. Ugh, gross. <laughs> but wait, I haven't even gotten to the really bad ones. We get it. Can you get to your point? I'm pretty sure we all know how gases work. Right, right. Moving on. The reason I'm here today is to talk about my discovery. I've discovered some gases that have no reaction at all. None whatsoever. <laughs> I know it's strange, but they really do exist. These gases have no smell or color, so it was hard to find out they existed, and their atoms don't connect with other atoms in any way. They act as if they're high class, which is why I've decided to call them noble gases. <laughs> what a stupid name that is for a stupid substance. More like boring gas. Uh, boring is a matter of opinion, I think. But these, these are amazing! And I've discovered a total of six noble gases so far. They are helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. You might be wondering why don't these gases have any reactions? It's because of the actions of their atoms, and specifically, their electrons. Electrons orbit a nucleus. If other atoms come along, they can form a molecule with the first atom. Then they share electrons. The electrons start sharing their orbits, and thus the connection is made. A regular gas has space between its electrons, meaning it's free game for another atom to come and react. But a noble gas doesn't have any extra room. As a result, they make terrible roommates, and no one else can ever make a connection with them. No reactions can happen. This type of gas, these noble gases, are extremely rare in our own atmosphere. When I was searching for them, in fact, I found that they make up less than 1% of our own atmosphere on Earth. So tell me, young scientist, <laughs> if these gases are so noble and don't react to anything, do they even have a purpose? Any practical use here? Why should any of us care about them? Well, I really didn't think they needed one. I just thought they were a cool discovery. <laughs> pointless! <laughs> nobly pointless! <laughs> it's just like this nobly pointless speech! <laughs> <laughs> if we do research, uh, maybe we could find... I mean, uh, a point for the noble gas. I had always wanted to be a famous scientist, but not a laughing stock. And as you can see, I got my encyclopedia page, but it's my biggest shame. <laughs> oh. So you still don't know how they can be used? These noble gases? Surely you found some use. The most common noble gas is helium, and everyone knows how that's used for birthdays, balloons, and such. My hypothesis was called the most useless discovery of all time, and I was shamed ever since. I'm a failure. You're the farthest thing from a failure I know. Sure, you pull a Darko here and there. I, I mean, uh, we know how brilliant you are. He's right, Darko. What do they know anyway? Thanks, you guys. And they sound like a bunch of boring old mooses. Because who doesn't like balloons? Yeah, balloons are my favorite. Listen, that's just a bunch of hooey in that article. <laughs> Here's what I'll do. I'll make that encyclopedia encyclopedia. I'll show you a thing or two. I'll tear you apart. Science meanies. Of the bad birthdays I've had, this is probably second. I'd hate to hear first. Here's the thing. We sustained some serious damage to the engine. Also, comm system fried. 
And that means that we can't even call for help. We're finished. <sighs> At least it's quiet on, uh, what planet are we on? On Mars. I can tell from its moons, Phobos and Deimos. And that way is Earth. We could even see it if we had a big enough telescope. You know where they have telescopes? On Earth, where they can see us! Hey, people of Earth! Check this out! There's a rabbit on Mars! You better come save him! I bet there's a big cowbell prize in store for whoever discovers these dummies on Mars! Ah! They couldn't see us. No matter how much we try, they just don't have the technology to see this far. But what if we made a big bonfire or something like that instead? A fire needs oxygen to burn, and Mars has none. It wouldn't burn. Then how about a big light bulb? An enormous, shiny light bulb! Of course! We can stop by the giant hardware store on Mars. I heard they're having a sale on giant light bulbs. Perfect! Um, there is a chance we could make a sort of gas lamp. Could be simple. No air needed. Here's how those work. A glass tube is filled with a regular old gas like nitrogen or carbon dioxide. Then we can put a current through it. Electrons inside start to go crazy flying through the gas, and they start running into some of the other atoms. This makes the gas glow. You've got it! <laughs> that type of light bulb would be much easier to put together, and it would probably consume a lot less energy. What are we waiting for? Problem is, this bulb would be fragile and break way too easily. Gases of that variety are quite unstable. If they produce the wrong kind of compound, the lamp would soon be destroyed. <laughs> Fine! We just need a gas that is the opposite of volatile and doesn't react at all. Sounds like an emotionally well-adjusted gas. Or a sleepy one. You know, guys, I think I've heard of that gas. Discovered by someone smart. Oh, yeah! I do remember hearing something about that stuff. And I think it was a really good scientist. I'm so confused. You all might be onto something here. We might have a use for the noble gases. Phenomenal. Each gas burns a different color. Simply amazing. This is a brilliant use of gases in a new application. Not even hot. And I bet it burns even longer than an incandescent bulb because the gases inside aren't reactive to anything. And this saves us a trip to the giant bulb store, so we should put it outside now. Or we could use it to write words, like send out chips. That's a good plan, but I have an even better idea. Oh my. We have a possible situation. You should come see this. There's something truly bizarre happening on the surface of Mars. It's unbelievable. Remarkable stuff. Mm. Inconceivable. Or oh, phenomenal. Uh, what's that? Holy carrots! They found us! It looks like this is a new page in the encyclopedia that now deserves to be written. Daco may have brought noble gases to Mars, but on our planet, their discovery goes way back. It's credited to two noble scientists themselves. Lord Rayleigh and Sir William Ramsey won the Cowbell, uh, sorry, Nobel Prize in 1904 in chemistry. Thanks, noble dudes. Get back to your lounging. that parents tell their children they have fantasy plots and try to teach a lesson. You want to hear a fairy tale? Uh, sorry, I don't really know how to tell any. 
Fine, come back here. I shouldn't have programmed you to be so cute. Okay, the story starts somewhere. Once upon a time, there was a wonderful, uh, arctic with a handsome, uh, penguin scientist. Wrong! You're already doing it wrong! Start with a princess. But how did I start wrong? Don't you know fairy tales? They need a princess, and they all have a love story. And you should change the place. It's, uh, cold up there. <laughs> Is that so? Well, fine, I guess. It begins in the, uh, warm climate of Somewheresville. And there's a beautiful princess, because apparently that's how they start. And one day she ran into a, um, uh, musician. Yeah, he played the lute. It was love at first sight. Ahem. I said it was love at first sight. <laughs> he decided to write the most beautiful song to impress Her Royal Highness. So he did. He played the best song, and she was very impressed. And then they got married, and they all lived happily ever after. They also got tax exemptions, which he needed as a musician. That's it? All he did was play a song? And he got the princess? <laughs> uh, maybe it was a magic song. The problem with your story is that there's no conflict. Nothing. Don't you see? Listen up. He can't get the princess just like that. He has to earn it. Make him work for it. <sighs> All right, fine. Now there is a bad guy who is no fun. <sighs> You're a hoot if you think that you can have her hand. Uh, that sounds right. <gasps> now you're stuck. You have to earn it. <laughs> I'm progressing the story with some conflict. <laughs> hey, princess. <clears throat> <laughs> so what happened next? I don't know. The tower's too tall, and maybe he left. They need a way to talk. There has to be some way to communicate. But how, though? Our heroes should use the classic telephone. Telephones take the sound waves we make with our voice and change them into electrical impulses. These originally traveled by copper wire. The electrical signals would travel to the recipient and be converted back into sound waves. As long as those copper wires reach us, we can talk to someone halfway across the globe, or a fairy tale kingdom. It'd be no problem to get telephone wires up the tower. Uh, hold on a second. So my fairy tale world has technology now? <laughs> Just a thought. Seems your characters are in a quandary. It's your story, after all. You can tell it as you like. Okay, fine. They have a telephone. The poor musician was at a loss. Then he had an idea. He had a friend who could help him out. The clever know-it-all wizard. The wizard said to him, You're in luck, my friend, because in this fairy tale world I have endless funding. Yesterday I invented something phenomenal. It's called a telephone. When the wizard was done patting himself on the back, our hero took the new machine out of the tower, determined to make the storyline work. I mean, woo the princess. Hmm? Hmm. 
The princess could finally hear the song and was impressed by the technology. They were happy forever and all was well. Hang on. That can't be everything. Oh, you're right. I forgot about the story's bad guy. Sounds to me the telephone's an easy way out. The witch wouldn't take kindly to this. <laughs> and she'd fight them. She'd cast a storm of magic. That'd do it. Not an actual storm. That would mess things up bad. Whatever. You think the princess is afraid of some lightning? I think she's a little better than that. Yeah, the musician is brave. In the story. Ah, uh, no doubt our heroes are brave. But it's the telephones we should be worried about. Remember, the electrical signals travel by copper wire. They have a magnetic field around them that help the pulses move. The problem with a physical copper wire is that someone can easily tap into that connection. Hey, you! Stop listening! Other problems can arise, too. The wires can be sensitive to radio waves. And lightning, too, since it's electricity, just like the pulses in the wires. With old phones, sometimes even electric engines can interfere. With these old-school phone wires, a lot of things can make them go haywire. Get it? <laughs> Never mind. Because of that, a thunderstorm would really mess things up for our story's heroes. Good! That's what she should do. A minor hurricane should do it. <laughs> you think you're clever, huh? Ah, lightning! <gasps> then what? The princess can never hear his music and... They never find each other? Beats me! Mm hmm. That's brilliant! They can use the power of fiber optics instead of wires! Good job! What's fiber optics? Like oatmeal? Good solution! If you have a light source, you can spread the light by moving it to a body of water. The water will reflect within the water's edges, meaning the light will travel wherever the water travels. <gasps> that must be how the lighted fountains work at fancy hotels! They're so pretty! How surprisingly perceptive of you, Rosa! That's exactly right! By this same principle, light can move with the help of wires. These wires are glass instead of copper. They're also called optical waveguides. Here's how they work. Light enters the outer shell of the glass wire and bounces along the waveguide. The light particles travel wherever the wire goes. Aren't fiber optics interesting? And luckily for our fairy tale heroes, fiber optics can also be used to transmit sound waves. In the very same way, sound travels through the wires and can be converted to different types of media. You can even convert the sound waves into light waves. Isn't technology phenomenal? The sound waves can go through all kinds of different formats. Eventually they get converted back into sound waves that our princess can hear. And here's something even better about fiber optics. It's a lot safer. There's less of a chance someone can listen in to your conversation. As another bonus, they aren't affected by external sounds, lightning, or engines. It's just what they need. Assuming they don't have copper, this could work better. To make fiber optics, all they need is quartz. And that is found in sand. <laughs> the characters have lots of that. They're in a desert. You're so right. The smart aleck wizard invented a new phone that used fiber optic cables instead of normal ones. He tossed the receiver up to the tower and played his beautiful song. This time, the sound was undeterred by lightning. The princess was impressed with the music. Not exactly Mozart, but her options were limited. And the annoying villain was finally out of options. <gasps> Does that end the story? Were they happy? I'd say so. This time the hero earned it. Don't forget, they also earned phenomenal phone service. 
<laughs> no, BB. They just made up. That's why they're called fairy tales. Just remember that none of that actually happened. Oh, well, maybe that story happened in a different universe. Using glass wires instead of copper ones is a huge breakthrough in phone communication. Fiber optics have made technology soar in the past few years. Fiber optics also contributed to the internet, making the whole world connected. And we have this guy to thank for it, Charles Cow, an electrical engineer from Hong Kong who won the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics for discovering fiber optics. Color yawn should I use next? Uh huh. I don't understand how princes found princesses in medieval times. I'm pretty sure they didn't have phones, so how did they know where to find each other? Um, oh, well, they would go to dances. Or they would just talk to whoever was nearby. Ugh, how boring! That's no way to live! Well, communication was limited back then. It was still romantic. Read this one already. This one was boring. Disappointing plot twist. Hmm. I think I read too fast for my own good. Dragons and magic. I don't have that. But I just have to become a princess. There must be a way for my prince to find me. And none of these are helping me. Don't worry, I'm sure he'll hear you. Hmm? Huh? I've read that whole series. Hmm. Our town is so isolated here, we're all in a bubble. No, we're in my house. What I mean is, we should communicate with the outside world, I think. Hi, guys. Pin, I need some building supplies. See how bored these poor kids are? They're turning to construction to fill their time. Uh-huh. They should be talking to new people, seeing new things. Oh, I'm taking this too. Roses are red, my wool is purple, my hooves are purple, and, uh, oh dear. You've really written yourself into a corner this time, Wally. Uh, wait, roses are... Oh, what rhymes roses? Uh, my, my wool is... Huh? Oh, it's just you. I was so certain my prince had finally come to find me. Seems I was wrong. What is this? A bunker? It's a tower built for a princess! I thought that would be obvious from the princess at the top, which is obviously me. Here's what I'll do. I'm going to wait up here until my beloved strolls by. Huh. So what happens if he doesn't? Oh, Wally, sheep of little faith. This is like the olden days. I'm taking charge of my fate by doing nothing. And this type of nothing is hard work. I have to maintain my beauty. Why are you here anyway? And stop looking so sheepish. I've been writing some new poetry and I could use some help. Do you want to read them? I promise, I won't hog all your time. First of all, no. Secondly, I have to wait for my prince. What makes you so sure he'll come? Because that's how stories go. He'll be someone tall, dark, and handsome. <gasps> Oh my, he's here, he's here! <laughs> Ooh, wax is Beano's again! Huh? Ugh. Hey, 
Hey, Crash. You want to put those big ears to use? I've written some new stuff. Sorry, no time. I'm on a winning streak. Well, yes. You're playing tic-tac-toe by yourself. I know. Hmm. And there, one again. I'm too good. <sighs> These kids need to talk to others their own age out in the world. Maybe we could help them. And by we, I mean Pin, of course. There's a wealth of information out there. Millions of people in the world exchanging information all day. If only there was some way to connect us all. <laughs> That's a good one, Pin. <laughs> As if a million computers could talk to each other like we're talking right now. <gasps> a computer is a device that stores and processes data, which can include music, photos, documents, and loads of other types of information. Nowadays, computers can hold so many different things and all types of media. Computers use binary, which is kind of like their own secret language that transmits data. And computers can communicate with each other with a little something called the Internet. We learn so much from what we hear and see. We can't yet feel, smell, or taste things in computers. But luckily, that's only 1% of things we learn. Sounds like computers are pretty useful for lots of different things. How many are there? A hundred? There's way more than that. They're being built every day. Someday every family will have their own computer. Okay, so what if we take our computer and connect it to everyone else's computer with wires? Hmm, now you might be on to something here. <gasps> A net of wires! Wait, so if every family has a computer at home and something with nets... Wait, I'm confused. It's about communication, my fine feathered friend. Imagine having your pictures on one computer and you can share them with someone far away. Words, images, videos, even games. By connecting all of the computers, we can share this information with everyone and we can learn from each other. That would be a hoot. The obvious way to do this would be to physically connect each system with a wire. Take a look. The info would travel from one system to the other, like a phone. But it would take a really long wire to reach the world. Probably millions of miles of it. Yeah, it would have to stretch pretty far, but I don't know what else we could do. <gasps> Wait, we need to think bigger with satellites. Computers can send each other information with the help of radio waves. But if they happen to be farther apart, it's harder for them to receive information. Luckily, there are transitional devices, which can help by catching that same signal and sending it out to where it needs to be. These are sometimes called transponders or wireless repeaters. And the more distance between two computers, the more of those cool guys you'll need. If you put a transponder really high, for example, say, orbiting the Earth, you get the ultimate power. It can send information back to a super wide range. Don't worry, little desktop. One satellite can reach almost half of the whole planet, which means the information goes way up to the satellite, then back down again, all before you can say, science is awesome. I think every computer should have its own special number. That's where you know who you're looking for. Oh, good idea. Like a phone number. Ugh, weird decoration. Every computer has a unique number called an IP address. It's like their name, only it's 12 numbers instead of Charlie or Timmy. With an IP address, computers can find one another the same way that your exact phone number makes your phone ring. It's a whole wonderful world of IP addresses sharing emails, music, and silly cat videos. Wow, just think! All of this information about to be in our hands! Or flippers. Now we'll be able to do so many things we couldn't do before, like do research, or play games, or even talk to people in a different country. Ooh, or what about buying some yarn? Of course. We'll be able to buy almost anything with this new, uh, taco net is what I want to call it. Let's 
not jump to naming anything just yet. Very well. You can search the internet to find tons of new books. You know, I've always been a fan of Dickens. Playing games by yourself is a thing of the past, and you'll always have an audience for sharing your new literary masterpieces. I could start a knitting club. <laughs> I'm sure strangers will only give constructive criticism of my poetry. Ah, internet. I love it. She has a goal in mind, but she's really hamming it up. Hey! Any luck with that prince yet? Not yet. But I haven't lost hope. I'm sure he's getting me a gift. Plus, by the time he gets here, my hair will be long and he can climb it. Although, that'll probably be painful. Huh. I hardly think that's worth the wait. Of course it is! That is my destiny! Huh? Why would this be your destiny? Sitting in a dark room, waiting for someone else to find you, never having any fun? You look like you could use some sun. Take charge of your life. Go out and find your own Prince Charming. Please, if you come down, I'll show you a different way. Your prince is in the 21st century, and I know how to find him. Good thing I'm great at taking pictures of myself. Hmm. Hmm, about me, huh? I'm a cute, brilliant princess. <gasps> oh, a response. Hmm. <laughs> I'm a vegetarian and enjoy long walks in pastures. You could say I'm raising the ba. <laughs> Earthling, the Plutonians give you thanks. You are a hero to our tiny planet. However, your own planet is an enemy. When the sun rises, our armies will descend upon your Earth and destroy it. No! Wait! You can't do this! They were just a few bad spacemen! You can't punish all of us for them! Your comments are noted, hero. We'll think about it. The Plutonians greet their hero with respect. Uh, hey there. We have reached a compromise regarding your planet. The Earthlings must pass our intelligence test to prove their right to not be destroyed. Uploading now. We expect our answer within one week's time. We will return then for the judgment. I don't... Good luck. Oh! <laughs> And we only have a week. If we all work together on it, we might just be able to solve it. And then we can save the planet. So what is this test exactly? Well, I haven't figured it out yet, but I'm close. I have a few ideas. Well, some very small ideas, that is. Is this test made for ants? Incredible! 
The Plutonian language is like them. It's so small. I'll need a more powerful microscope. Your average optical microscope has two main portions, the object lens and the eyepiece. The lens gathers visible light that bounces off an object, magnifies the image, and lets us see it through the eyepiece. Microscopes are super cool and can let us see a whole world of things that are too small to see with the naked eye. They can enlarge things up to 2,000 times. I just can't figure this out. It's too small for me to see. You have a weird sense of humor, friend, but April Fool's is a long way off. But wait a second. None of you guys believe me? About the aliens? <laughs> oh, are you sure it wasn't a weird dream? I'm hoping this is all a weird dream. And that my friends didn't wake me up for this. So these alien guys, they wanted us to prove our, whatchamacallit, smartness, right? But I bet we can beat these aliens, whatever you call them. Plutonians. Oh, gazoontite. No, this isn't fun. This is of utmost importance to our planet's future. Don't you all see what I mean? Daco, we all enjoy a good prank, but next time let us sleep. Whatever's written on the test is too small to see with our current technology. I have to be calm and rational about this. <laughs> no need to be discouraged. If we work together, we can get this. I might need sleep. Go back to the microscope. Why do you think it doesn't go as small as you want it to? Light travels in waves. All these light waves have a wavelength, or a distance between the waves. Visible light has a minimum wavelength of 380 nanometers. Visible light is how we're able to see objects. The waves bounce off and go back to our eyes, but the object has to be bigger than the size of the wavelength. If it's not, the waves simply pass over it, and that's why we can't see things that are super small. If you want to see smaller wavelengths, why don't you try radiation? We still couldn't see it. Our eyeballs just aren't capable. Easy, then just project the findings onto a screen. Zoom in on it. You'll be able to see it. Hmm, you are a genius. I mean, um, I'm a genius. <laughs> uh. Listen up, everyone. I've invented something that proves Earthlings have intelligence once and for all. The electron microscope. Oh. The electron beam comes from a tiny point of super hot tungsten. The beam, just like regular light in an optical microscope, gets focused by a special electromagnetic lens. Then, the electrons fly around through the sample at super fast speeds, because they're electrons, of course, and create an image. This image is shown on a screen and enlarged several thousand times. Whoa, look at all those crazy things. Thanks to electron microscopes, we're able to see all kinds of things way smaller than with an optical microscope. Thanks, Electrons! With this, I can finally see how those Plutonians plan to test our intelligence! He's still talking about the aliens? Daco needs a serious nap. I missed the memo. What are we all doing here? I don't understand. I made the image larger, but there isn't any message like I thought there would be. Any smaller and we're talking nanoparticles. I don't have anything that can do that. I failed our whole planet. Daco, relax. Why do you worry so much? When's the last time you slept? I can sleep when the planet's safe. There's only three days left until the Plutonians said they destroy us. I'm a dummy. <laughs> You're hardly a dummy. A dummy wouldn't have been able to create the technology you have in such a short time. And I know some dummies. If the Earth is going to be destroyed, who says you have to save it? All right, drink this. You need to relax, Daco. I had an uncle who talked to aliens. We called this his crazy juice. <laughs> It'll put him right to sleep, like a baby. No more aliens, for sure. It seems you are late, hero. Oh! <laughs> 
Uh-oh. Oh, can we talk about this? <laughs> Maybe there was something in Doggo's story. Get off my tail feathers! Save me! They've got me! I'm blind! Oh! <laughs> I've got it! My microscope! If we're not able to see something, we should be able to touch it. But on a molecular level, if we made something we could control with our hooves or flippers, we could see way more on the tiny scale than we ever could before. I'm fairly clever if I do say so. Even though electron microscopes are amazing, there's still some things they can't see. That's right, too small even for electron microscopes. When that happens, we need the use of nano objects to help us out. Nano objects can help us by touching the tiny thing we're looking at. It's so sensitive we use something smaller than the point of a needle, and scientists are able to move it along the surface of the object. It reacts to the nanoparticles in a way that lets us see the surface. The needle uses a laser to project the image, and voila! Now we can see extra tiny nanoparticles. And that's how we'll read the message with nanoparticles! Hero, what is your answer on behalf of Earth? It is four. Is is that your final answer? Yes, it is. The Earthlings are correct. So, heard from any aliens lately? <laughs> <laughs> That's all good now. We're safe. I answered them. <laughs> <laughs> you are weird. <laughs> Still not April Fools. <laughs> huh? Five hundred kilometers, turn to the right. Yep, will do. In three hundred kilometers, turn to the yeah, right. Thanks very much, but I heard you the first time. Checkmate, huh? are you sure you know how to play this? In one hundred kilometers, Great flaming carrots, what is your malfunction? Right. How many times are you gonna say it? You have missed the turn, flawed huh? carbon based being. But there is another turn in three hundred Why kilometers. Why did you say something, you piece of junk? That's a bit of an overreaction, my dramatic friend. Global satellite navigation is an intelligent and super helpful invention. The only thing it's good at is being super <laughs> annoying. Remember, before GPS, we had to use less advanced and less accurate means of navigation. It was crazy. For instance...
He should be back by now. I hope there hasn't been an accident. Oh, what if something has gone amiss? <laughs> Sweet sauerkraut! <laughs> base! Come in, base! The condor here! Base! It's condor! Do you read me? Base right here! Hello? Base! Condor here! Flight test is underway! Do you read me, base? I'm so glad to hear that! I'm currently flying over the desert! There's a bit of a dust storm! My compass... It's damaged. It's hard for me to tell exactly where I am. Come again? Am I to understand? You're really lost? Well, I wouldn't say I'm not lost. Thank you, my friend. I know you're very brave and ready to help, but the desert is simply too large, and we have no idea at all where Pin is. It'd be like looking for one particular grain of sand on the entire beach. Excellent thinking! What a wonderful idea! That's called inversion method, solving the problem through contrast. Reverse reasoning, or backward chaining, is a way of thinking that turns your problem upside down, working from a goal backwards to the start to find out what to do. It's much easier for Pin to look for us than for us to look for Pin. To put it simply, Pin needs to find the right direction to get out of the desert. Right. Sure, it's tricky with no compass in the middle of the desert, but explorers of the past used to find the right way somehow. Since the horizon is continuous, if you know one direction, like which way north is, you can figure out all of the others based on that one you know. If you get lost and you don't have a compass, the position of the sun can play that role for you. For instance, in the northern hemisphere, the sun rises in the east, arrives in the south around noon, and sets in the west. Hey, look at that! <gasps> ah, yes, nighttime. Well, at night we have... Uh, wait, uh, almost... We have the polar star. Groovy, Duncan! The North Star, or Polaris, shines above the Earth's true north. It can be found at the end of the Little Dipper's handle. To find it, draw a line from the front two stars of the Big Dipper straight up to the end of the Little Dipper, and there's Polaris, the North Star. Now, if you can't see the sun or the stars, you can also find your way by things around you in nature. Moss or lichen covers stones and trees on their northern sides. Tree bark is harder and darker facing north and anthills are usually located north of tree stands. And the southern side of the anthill will be shallower than the northern one. Alrighty, still lost. Condor, Condor, it's base. I've got grand news for you. If you don't have a compass, you can always find your way by using the stars. Or anthills. I'll explain how. <sighs> nicht for stars, nicht for hills events, nicht for everything, except for the sand. And that there's a lot of. Think, 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 think. There must be a way. Nothing's impossible. Except, of course, for all the things that are impossible, of which this is not one. BB, forget old-fashioned methods. Did you know it's possible to determine where a person is with the help of satellites up in space? Satellite navigation can determine someone's location with amazing accuracy to within a few meters. Small electronic receivers determine latitude, longitude, altitude, and achieve time synchronization. Satellite navigation has three segments. 
about 24 satellites, give or take a few, form what's known as the space segment. The control segment is an intricate network of antennas at monitors and control stations on the ground. And the user segment is an electronic receiver you hold in your hand or carry in your vehicle. The 24 satellites are about 20,020 kilometers above the Earth. They are divided into six groups, four satellites in each one. Each group of four satellites moves on the same orbit and makes one revolution around the Earth in 12 hours. By dividing all of the satellites into equal parts, there are at least four satellites positioned over each segment of the planet at all times. To determine location, a user's receiver determines the distance to three visible satellites. The distance to one of the satellites is X, so the receiver can be placed in an imaginary green sphere with its center at the point of the satellite location and X radius. The receiver then measures the distance to the second satellite. And here's another sphere. The receiver can then be placed at the point where these two spheres intersect. For clarity, let's make it red. Having calculated the distance to the third satellite, the receiver constructs the third sphere and determines two points of its intersection with the red circle. As you can see, one of the points is in space, so we can discard that. And using this method of triangulation, we can determine exactly where the receiver is. What do you recommend, my mechanical friend? Will we be able to successfully construct a, um, uh, enough satellites to pull this off? See here. One, two, three. Exactly the number needed for Pin to determine his coordinates. satellite carries four atomic clocks that work to an accuracy of one second in 20 million years. And every satellite creates its own unique impulse sequence. The user's receiver gets this impulse sequence with a delay that is equal to the time needed for the signal to cover the distance between receiver and satellite. So, to determine location, the receiver must measure three signal time delays from three different satellites. Ha 
Know what, GPS? I think you're pretty cool after all. So how about it? Friends? You have missed the turn again. <gasps> Unbelievable. There is another turn in three million kilometers. That's it. We're replacing you with an anthill. 